نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. يكفيني ان شاء الله تعالى فرض موقف صحيح الامام ابن البخاري رحمه الله ان تشتت الارض والاعتصام والكتاب والسنه تو هود فاس تو الكتاب تو القران ان السنه فرض الرافض عليه الصلاه والسلام. He will finish the first two sub chapters in the book and the third one he says باب ما يكره من كثرة السؤال فتكل في ما لا يعني وقوله تعالى لا تسأل عن أشياء إن تبد لكم تسوء The title means ما يكره What is disliked What is مكروه What is disliked من كثرة السؤال السؤال is asking questioning كثرة meaning a lot of questions a lot of asking a lot of questions to be said وتكل في ما لا يعني and to make تكلف to go out of one's way to make it difficult for oneself to see things that has no benefit whatsoever or has no concern to the person. And the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, لا تسألوا عن أشياء إن تبد لكم تسوء. Do not ask about matters, about things, that if it becomes clear to you, it will harm you. So what is the subject here? The subject is about questioning too much, or asking too many questions. A su'al or asking can be something recommended, something mandatory, and can be also something forbidden or something disliked. So the same thing can be good or bad, it depends on the context and what it's for and what it's, you know, according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. To ask the people of knowledge with matters of the deen, definitely this is a good thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Uh, asking people for uh, means of help, like sadaqah, charity, and so on, this can be haram if a person is in no need and he asks from people. The Prophet ﷺ said that that person will come in the Day of Judgment without a piece of flesh on his skin or in his face in the Day of Judgment because he had asked people when he has already means of sustenance. It's only permissible if a person is in dire need he is dying out of hunger and has no means whatsoever to sustain his life, then it's permissible, not recommended, but it's permissible for the person to ask. The subject here is about asking with matters of knowledge and matters of the deen. When people ask about matters of the deen, as we said, sometimes it's obligatory. If a person doesn't have the knowledge, he needs to make salah, he needs to pay zakah, he needs to know what is halal and what is haram. He has to, he has, to ask the people of knowledge. But what is forbidden here or what is disliked is when people ask about things that has no benefit, things of no concern, uh, things of too much details that has nothing in the way with it. Because everything came in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet is definitely beneficial and every person needs to know it. So the things that the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not come down with, then there is no need for us to ask about it. Beyond what's in the Wahid uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or to ask for the sake of questioning, to make someone look bad, for example, to ask to look uh, as if a person is a knowledgeable person, that many different masail or matters of deen that people invent. What if, what if, too many what ifs, right? That is not practical. Things that never happened and just people ask about it. And even the ulama mentioned like the too much details about things like of ruh, the soul, and the nafs, and there is not too much practical, uh, you know, uh, outcome to it. Things that has no benefit, just people want to ask for the sake of asking. And, of course, with the matters of philosophy and things like that, people can get into so much deep of things that has no benefit whatsoever. The deen of Islam is such a straightforward, clear, easy way of life that we are supposed to be away from any, any means of takalluf, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they are away from that. And even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet والسلام, that about the Prophet والسلام, I don't ask you any, any recompense or reward from you, and I am not from the mutakallifin, not from those who show off or to do things out of the way that is not part of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as it also would come with the hadith that we would hear. So this is a way of life. It's basically for us to learn how to deal with matters of the deen and what to ask about and what not and things of that nature. Uh, and the ayah as it will be explained in the hadith, the first hadith, 
especially at the time of the Wahy when it was coming down on the Prophet ﷺ. During the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba were forbidden from asking about things that the Wahy didn't come down yet with. Revelation did not come down yet with some rulings, don't ask about it yet. Because this is the time when the revelation is coming down. The deed is not completed yet. And this is where the ayah comes in place. And that's why, as the hadith of Anas, they used to like when the Bedouins come. They did learn this etiquette that these Bedouins would ask the Prophet questions. So the Prophet would answer them and they would learn from the answering of the Prophet. As it shows in the first hadith, there are like nine hadith in the chapter, so we will try to be uh, brief so that we can cover them all, inshallah. He says, حدثنا عبد الله بن يزيد المقرى قال حدثنا سعيد قال حدثني عقيل عن ابن شهاب عن عامر بن سعد بن أبي وقاص عن أبي أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال رفض عليه الصلاة والسلام سد إن أعظم المسلمين جرما من سأل عن شيء لم يحضر فحرم من أجل مسألته رفض عليه الصلاة والسلام سيد إن أعظم المسلمين جرما the worst or the a'dham from azim big, right? So the biggest jurm, jurm is sin, crime. The biggest sin that a Muslim would commit, man sa'al an shay, the one that would ask about something, lam yuhabwa, was not forbidden, fahul rima min ati mas'alati, then it was made forbidden as a result of this question. And this is clearly during the wahi when coming down. So when the wahi is coming down and people would ask for something to be forbidden, as Bani Israel did to the prophets before, they would ask for something. They want this to be haram. They want this to be like that and so on. So as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them because of the bad manners with, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with not humbling themselves to the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the wahi can come and forbid what they ask for. So this is specifically when the wahi is coming down. After the revelation is finished, there is no such a thing because the deen has been completed, right? But sometimes people, when there are too many questioning, they can make it very difficult for themselves. So they still have to abide by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. And again, it doesn't mean not to ask. We should, we should ask about every single detail of our life to make it according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is very specific to the time when the Wahi was revealed. It shows in A'ma al-Muslimina Jumma, this is one of the major, major sins. Why? Because it would affect everyone with matters of uh, difficulty on them. Uh, although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He decree a matter, the means to it will be made easy. Right? So, as a result of the actions of the people, then things will be according. This Ummah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on. And this is the last revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is nothing in the deen of Islam that has been made haram on us as a way of making it difficult for us as the nations before. Allah relieved this woman from this. Right? So the hearts need to be contented, to be comfortable. Because the Sahaba, they were the best generation ever brought to mankind. And this is again to show their favor upon us. They had a favor upon us and that's why we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with them all the time we say Allah subhanahu wa it's part of our aqidah, part of our iman, to believe in them in the right way, that they are the best generation ever brought to mankind. They were not like many Israel, what they did to Musa alayhi when they made it difficult for themselves, when they disobeyed the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they asked for more harm to them, as the famous story of al-Baqarah with the cow, as it's mentioned in Surah al-Baqarah. The order was just slaughter the cow. They were not satisfied with this. The matter is easy and simple, so they make it difficult for themselves. What color, what it looks like. So every time they ask, it was made more difficult for them. Uh, so this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved this woman from that as a way to show the blessings of the companions of the Prophet And why? Because they abide by this ruling, they would not ask the Prophet with matters like this. Only some things which was even good for the ummah that when the Sahaba did and the, the knowledge of it was lifted, it was even good, best for them, like the knowledge of Laylatul Qadr. When the Prophet ﷺ got the message of what Laylatul Qadr is, 
And then there was two of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they were arguing with one another. And as a result of that, the knowledge of it was lifted. So the Prophet ﷺ was made to forget it. And he said that ﷺ, and then he said, فَالْتَمِسُوهَا فِي الْعَشْرِ الْأَخِ Then seek it in the last ten nights of Ramadan. So it's definitely, more like, most likely, in the last ten nights of Ramadan, one of these nights. So why is it better that the knowledge of it is, is lifted up? So that people would make more effort in the last ten nights of Ramadan. So they would get the reward of Laylatul Qadr and the reward of all the ibadah that they did in the whole ten nights. But if it's only one night specific, you would find the masajid empty the whole month of Ramadan. And then only one night, uh, things are packed and that's it. So it's out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the knowledge like this was lifted at the time of the Prophet but as far as things became forbidden uh, because of the questioning and so on, this was not for the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. Therefore, anything in Deen of Islam, halal and haram, is not to make it difficult for our life and for ourselves, it's to make it easy for us. Make it easy for us to establish the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most perfect way. And anything that is forbidden by the great wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a reason behind it, there's a wisdom behind it to establish the perfect life. If you find it that it's difficult for oneself to abide by the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not because the deen is difficult. As we said before, it's the people make their life difficult. When they indulge into haram and so on, it becomes the norm of their life. So if they want to be righteous, it becomes difficult for them. Plus human beings in general, they tend to be rebellious. They want to just follow their desires. So when people do bad, they know that it's bad. And it's difficult for them to avoid what is bad and some of them would wish for someone to drag them to do what is right. Someone uh, in, in state of intoxication or he's, he's addicted to something, he wished that he can get out of it, but he's still doing it, right? So this is the misery of the human beings. So the truth and what is good and what the pure life is in following the orders of Allah and the way of the Messenger So this also has to be understood in, in the light of these ahad. The next hadith, he says, حدثنا إسحاق قال أخبرنا عفاق قال حدثنا وهيب قال حدثنا موسى بن عفاق قال سمعت أبا النضر يحدث عن بسر بن سعيد عن زيد بن ثابت أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم زيد بن ثابت رضي الله عنه said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم اتخذ حجرة في المسجد من حصير The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام took a room in the masjid from حصير حصير is a straw mat the mat that would make marks uh, on your foot when you stand on it, on your cheeks if you sleep on it, from straws, made from straws. I'm not sure if anybody have seen these mats, uh, you know, back home as many massages, or now actually it's disappearing, everybody's using carpet. But this is something common that people would have. So the Prophet ﷺ, his masjid was not from Hasid, it was not uh, the whole masjid, but there was a room in there that uh, the Hasid or the straw mat was on it. فصلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيها ليالي رفت عليه الصلاة والسلام prayed there uh, nights one night after another and this was uh, in رمضان فصلى in رمضان in the night prayer حتى اجتمع إليه ناس till people gathered and they became they made جماعة behind the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام ثم فقدوا صوته ليلة فظنوا أنه قد نام so they missed the voice of the Prophet night. Every night he's there والسلام, making salat, the night prayer. And people, how can they uh, stay home when the Prophet والسلام, he's uh, making salat and they can hear his voice. People rush to the message to show the righteousness and the love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger So one night the Prophet والسلام, uh, did not come out. And they did not hear the voice of the Prophet والسلام, So they thought that he was asleep. That night. Some of them start doing what يتنحنح is when you're <coughs> like this. To make noise so that the Prophet will come out to them. They want to call the Prophet but it's out of bad manners to do that. So they would make like these types of noise, but we would do that all the time. So that the Prophet would come out to them. فقال the Prophet ﷺ said ما زال بكم الذي رأيت من صنيعكم حتى خشيت أن يكتب عليه. He 
said, you kept on doing what I've seen you doing, meaning coming every night to pray behind me and so on, till I have become afraid that it becomes mandatory on you. That means he was worried that the Wahi can come there asking for it, that it becomes mandatory for them to do the night prayer. It's only optional. So out of the mercy that he had towards them, he was afraid that the Wahi might come and make it obligatory. And when people are righteous, they can ask for things like this with their actions. And if it was mandatory on them, they would have loved it, right? That this is a matter of worship, they're coming willing, willingly for it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make it easy for them. And the optional acts of worship, it elevates the person, of course, in high levels, but it's only optional, not mandatory. Uh, so this is why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he did not come out that night out of the fear that it became obligatory. And if it becomes mandatory or you written upon you to do it, you will not be able to establish it in the most perfect way. Imagine every night, like Tarawih, like in Ramadan, this is a whole year mandatory. And even in Ramadan, other than Ramadan, becomes an obligation. It becomes different. So many people would fall into more sins. I mean, that along the five daily cycle which is only five, it's not 50 or anything, and still many sins are committed as a result of not establishing the salah, and there's no excuse whatsoever uh, in missing the salah, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so easy. And that's why uh, there's no excuse whatsoever in missing it, unless a person, of course, special cases and special situations where a person can delay the salah or so, uh, this is something else. Prophet then addressing them. He said, Salmu, pray, ayyuhan nas, O people, fi buyutikum in your homes, pray, pray in your homes. Fa inna afdala salati marki fi baytihi illa salat al maktub. Because indeed the best salat of the human being, of the person, in his house, except the obligatory salat. The best salat for the person to be prayed in his home, unless it's the obligatory salat. So that's why because of this subset, the hadith here did not refer to the prayer of Ramadan. Because the Prophet ﷺ approved for them to pray in the masjid, the night prayer. With the other hadith, he approved for them, ﷺ, that they would pray in the masjid in different jama'at. So they would pray in congregation in the masjid, but few people would, uh, you know, would want jama'at, another jama'at, and so on. It's only at the time of Umar that he gathered them behind one imam. So it was not something new because they already used to do that in Ramadan, only in Ramadan, to pray in the masjid, the night prayer, in uh, different groups. Uh, so that's why it was something else. At another time when the Prophet did that in the night prayer and they gathered, so he was afraid والسلام, that the night prayer becomes mandatory for them. And you see the last statement is a very uh, important statement. It's a way of life. Prophet ﷺ is ordering us to pray at home, not the Fardh Salah, only the, op uh, the optional Salah. And there is other hadith where it shows that the optional Salah, even the Sunnah prayer, if a person prays it at home, the reward is given, multiplied to 25 or 27 like Salat al Jama'ah when he prays in the Masjid. Right? And this is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And this has some uh, just details to make sure that we understand this point correctly. Uh, the Sunnah prayer, the 12 Rakha Sunnah, right? Uh, definitely, if a person, the, the, the Sunnah after the Salah, like after Salat al after Salat al Isha, definitely it's better to be prayed at home. Unless a person might be lazy, might go home and forget, and this is a way of shaitan. Tell, him, uh, tell the person, pray at home is better for you, it's more reward this way. He used to pray in the masjid every time after Salat al Isha, but now he got to hear this, so he started taking what is better and he would go to home and he would pray there. Then he's lazy, he forgets and he doesn't pray it and then after some time he would not pray the sunnah of al Isha as well. Then it's better than in that case that he should continue to pray salat al sunnah al Isha in the masjid so that he does not miss it, right? We have to be aware of the steps of shaitan. Mm. Uh, the sunnah before the salat, like sunnah al dhuhr for example, uh, people usually won't wait for you. So the adhan and the iqam, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If you pray at home and you come, you would miss takbiratul ihram. A person with no knowledge, he would say, let me pray sunnatul dhuhr at home, and then I can catch the salah in the last rakah. Right? This is how I apply the sunnah. No, you miss the sunnah. 
right? Because you missed the first like part. So to be there behind the Imam, to come early to Salat, especially Salat al dhuhr which is from the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, definitely this is recommended. So the ulama, they say, for the Ma'moom, definitely it's more recommended for him to come early for the Salat. And the more, the earlier you come, the more reward the matter is. As for the Imam, if people would wait for the Imam nowadays, nobody wait for the Imam because it's time for the come. Right? It's by the, by the second. But in places where they wait for the Imam, the Imam should not be late to make it difficult for the people. Then in that case, it's best for the Imam, as the Prophet ﷺ used to do. Most of the time that he would come out from his uh, room والسلام, to lead the Salah right away. And he would pray the Sunnah in his house or in his room, meaning the, the before Sunnah. So we have to understand this concept so that we don't miss what is best. So the best is to come early to the Masjid, and the best is to make the Sunnah pray. If it's at home, mashallah, it's good. If not home, then in the masjid. The night prayer, as we hear in the hadith, definitely at home, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered. Except in Ramadan. Ramadan only, where people pray in the masjid, yes, that's from the Sunnah of the Prophet But throughout the year, when people, when they get together sometime to pray the night prayer in the masjid, this is not what is recommended. What is recommended for them is to pray at home. But if it happens, they were in the masjid for some reason, and they stayed for some time, and uh, let's just pray to Raqqa together, there's no harm. But without planning, advertising, night prayer on Thursday night, and as a way to keep on the habit after Ramadan, this is not from the Sunnah of the Prophet and we should stay away from these types of practices. If we want to make means of da'wah and encourage people to make ibadah, then we should do things according to the way of the Prophet But again, if people are together, at home or in the masjid, and they felt like making two rak'ah together in jama'ah after the salat, there is no harm, this is not bid'ah like this, it's not innovation in the deen like this. It's only the organized rituality of things, this is what makes things uh, not according to the way the Prophet ﷺ. And also the statement, the best salat of the person is at home unless it's the obligatory salat, which shows that the obligatory salat when it's prayed at home, it's a, it's a very uh, deficient one. Right? Even if the person has the, you know, he's far away from the masjid. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for? To live away from the masjid and to pray at home. It's not to make it different for ourselves. Yes, it's permissible. If a person is away from the masjid, and it's uh, no sin on the person if he's away from the masjid. But when the whole entire life like this, well, this is, uh, what is the purpose of our life? So many good deeds that are missed when a person uh, does not pray in the masjid. And this is part of this ummah that has been missed so much. Especially here in America, right? People, there is a masjid, it's been the norm of the Muslims, masjid and people are not the masjid. And they come to the masjid. And they, they don't have to walk to the masjid, yes, but they always, the masjid is part of your life as a Muslim. We're not like uh, Christians or so, they come to the masjid Sunday only, uh, as many now, they come to the masjid only on uh, Friday. This was not known at the time of the Prophet If uh, the companions of the Prophet would see that face of Muslims, or uh, you know, the, the salah, or the people come to the masjid only on Friday. This is like as if it's a new religion. There's no such a thing that the munafiq, the hypocrites, they used to come to salat al fard the jama'ah, every day. And that's why the Prophet said that أثقل الصلاة المنافقين صلاة الفجر والعشاء That the heaviest two salah on the hypocrites is fajr al -ishan. And if they know the reward in it, they would come to it even if they have to crawl. So they would, used to come because they knew, as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud anhu, he said that that the one that used to miss Salat al in the Masjid was a munafiq, a hypocrite, ma'lum al nifaq, known for his hypocrisy. These were the only ones that would miss Salat al in the Masjid, like persistently, not because of an excuse here or there. The person is at work, far away from the Masjid, as they used to do, someone would take his uh, goats or whatever outside and whenever the time of the Salah comes and this is something that Allah loves from the Muslim to do whenever the time of the Salah comes he makes the Adhan and he come and he makes Salah in whatever place there is the earth has been made for me a place of Salah and also purification if there is no water we use it for them but to choose that the norm of our life is like this this is definitely something that we need to review and to make sure the masjid is part of our life. So we learn that also from that statement and it shows that the houses should not be deserted. 
And the Prophet ﷺ, another hadith, he said, Let the Buddha come to Bora. Do not make your homes like graveyard. Meaning, no salah in it. Graveyard, you cannot make salah, except salah from Jannah. And he said, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not make your homes Qubura. This is to who? He said that to the Sahaba because they would pray in the masjid. So when you pray the obligatory salah in the masjid, and then you're not praying the sunnah prayer because it's optional, it's recommended, then the house becomes like a graveyard. So that means, for those who Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala guided them and bestowed His favor upon them, to pray in the masjid, this is a favor from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, that they should make sure as a way to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they should have some salah at home, optional salah. Sunnah prayer or night prayer or so, so that the houses are not graveyards as the Prophet ﷺ says. Yeah, so great benefits to learn from this. But the point in the chapter that the Prophet ﷺ stopped what he was doing so that out of the field that becomes obligatory to them because as if they're asking for it. يقول حدثنا يوسف بن موسى قال حدثنا أسامة عن بريد عن أبي بردة عن بريد بن أبي بردة عن أبي بردة في مصفاقة عن أبي موسى الأشعري رضي الله عنه قال سئل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن أشياء كريهة This hadith was mentioned before so we won't spend so much time talking about it The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام was asked about things that he disliked Asking about things that has no benefit So he disliked it عليه الصلاة والسلام فلما أكثروا عليه مسألة غضب، when they kept on asking and kept on asking the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that angry، they used to see that in the face of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم، the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم never get angry for his own sake، it's only for the sake of Allah سبحانه وتعالى، this anger this anger is not like when people get angry they act foolishly، no but they would see that in the face of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when the orders of Allah had been broken، when they do something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade them from doing. So then as a result of that, the Prophet said, وَقَالَ سَلُونِ Ask me. Opposite to what he might say, stop asking. No, he said then ask whatever you want as a way of showing that he is not pleased with this. فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ فَقَالَ So a man stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, مَنْ أَبِي O Messenger of Allah, who is my father? Right, as you see the question, what's the benefit of that? Who is my father? It was said that he was always called that he is born out of wedlock, so nobody knows his father. So he asked, Who is my father? He said, Abu Kahudaf, the father is Hudaf. Then another man stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, my Abi, who is my father? So the Prophet called, Abu Kasalim, Mawla Shay. Said, The Mawla, the slave of Shay. فلما رأى عمر ما بوجه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الغضب when Umar رضي الله عنه saw in the face of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام that he's displeased with this قال إنا نتوب إلى الله عز وجل he said we repent to Allah سبحانه وتعالى because this is something if the Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام is upset with them that means Allah سبحانه وتعالى will you know be angry with them so they repented to Allah سبحانه وتعالى from such a thing and again this shows the virtues of the Sahaba رضي الله عنه the point is they were forbidden from asking too much, especially with questions that has no benefit to it. I will have that I'm also going to have that I'm 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 going to have that Muawiyah the Khalifa said to him, let him say, write to me what you heard from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wants to know more of what he heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it shows that not all the Sahaba heard everything from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, this is why they would have sometimes differences. Even Abu Bakr and Umar would tell Allah, you know, sometimes they would miss something because they were not with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at all times. So they would ask one another, and uh, someone would come and say, I heard this and so on. So he, that's what he sent to him. So uh, he sent back to him, he wrote to him, in the Nabi Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كان يقول في دبر كل صلاة that the Prophet of Allah used to say في uh, دبر, at the end of every salah, uh, after finishing the salah, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد. وهو على كل 
شيء قدير اللهم لا مانع لما اعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع للجد منك الجد. This is something to be said after salah, right? Immediately from the adhkar of finishing the salah is to say this. So uh, he said that, he wrote that to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. This is valuable information. Right? And see how the Khalifa is asking him. The wali is sending him. So we should not belittle these adhkar whatsoever. We feel like it comes so easy for them, but for them, they spend effort and, and wealth and so on for them to learn these uh, you know, treasures from the way the Prophet ﷺ. This dhikr actually is important for us to know the meaning of briefly since we say it all the time after the salah. La ilaha illa Allah, wa la sharika la exclude. No one is worthy of worship except Allah, there is no partners. La al mulk wa la al hamd. Al mulk, the kingdom, the dominion, the ownership is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To him is Alhamd, the perfect praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa huwa ala kulli shayi qadeer, and he is capable, able of all things. And again, as we hear that all the time, our adhkar should come from the heart and the tongue together, so that we mean what we say, so that we can get the full rewards of what we say. Allahumma la mani'a lima a'tayt. What does that mean? Wa Allah, there is no mani'a. Mani'a is no one is to deprive or to uh, prevent what you have been given. If you give someone something, nobody can take that away or prevent what your goodness from coming to others. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give someone something. And if you deprive, if you withhold, nobody can give because he's the owner of all things. And this is tawheed, right? this is oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we stop witnessing so much and looking so much at the human beings when they give or deprive or withhold. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the human beings are means, right? So that the obedience is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, we turn uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our hearts attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What that statement means, what I am fa'a, al is the benefit. The jad, the one of fortune, the one that has fortune and whatever, what the word uh, fortune and, and wealth and so on, he does not benefit whatsoever, uh, as long as the benefit is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the benefit has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody, his fortune can benefit him unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willing for that to happen because he's the owner of all things. So after he said that to him, also he wrote to him more. He said that the Prophet كان ينهى عن عقوق الأمهات ووقت البنات ومنع الوحيد. Six things he said the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام forbid. قيل وقال. قيل means it was said. قال he said. So it means he forbid. He said, she said. You know these types of things. Meaning narrating what people say like that. Or so and so he said this and so and so said that. Narrating the words of people without making sure that it's authentic. Without making sure that it's benefiting, otherwise it can cause harm and it can be uh, under the category of slandering and mima and backbiting and so on. And as the Prophet said, <laughs> it is enough lying for a person that he would narrate and say everything that he hears. If we say everything we hear, that means we're liars. A person is a liar if you do this. And he should not say, what well, this is what they said. No, it's not enough. A person has to make sure that this is true and has benefit in narrating it. That's why we definitely are in need of this, especially with all kinds of uh, means that we get to know things, whether it's the news or the media, or people say things over the net and we just, it's enough for us that so, someone said it, that means it's the truth. Definitely this is not permissible. So the Prophet ﷺ forbade that clearly. وَكَثْرَةِ السُّوَالَ And that's why the hadith is here. كَثْرَةِ السُّوَالَ To ask too much of no benefit. Not the benefit in question, but the ones that has no benefit. وَإِضَاعَةِ الْمَالِ He forbade إِضَاعَةِ الْمَالِ To waste money. To waste money. Of course, if the money is spent on haram, even if it's a penny, that's haram, even if it's a penny, if it's spent on haram. But to spend money in halal, but as a way of waste. Too much food, and then it's thrown into the garbage. Food is money. Money is not just cash, right? Anything that has a value, that's money. So wasting money, whether we waste food or, or nobody will take money and just throw it. Uh, you know, when people 
when we spend, we have to make sure that we earn it from halal, we spend it in whatever is benefiting, and not to waste money. Not to be greedy, of course, there's limits to things. A person can go to one extreme or the other, can be in the extreme of lavish spending, can be greedy. And the right is something in the middle, a person should spend, and there will be a benefit of spending, uh, and not to be always wasting wealth. And this by itself is a subject to be discussed. وكمان نعم عقوق الأمهات يعني used to forbid عقوق الأمهات to be uh, bad or not giving the rights of the mothers of course the mothers and the fathers uh, and well it is the order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be kind to them but he specifically mentioned the mothers because the mother right not that she has more rights than the father right it's a delicate difference here it's uh, Definitely the Prophet ﷺ when he was asked when a haqq al-nazi who is among the people that has the most right of my companionship? He said, Ummuk, your mother. Then he was asked, then who? He said, Ummuk, your mother. Then he was asked, then who? Your mother. So three times, your mother. And then the fourth time, your father. So because of that, of course, the mother, she is the one that carried the pregnancy and what comes after that. It's something that is very obvious and we see why she has more rights. But it doesn't mean that the father is to be disobeyed, right? It's just a matter when they're both together, definitely, uh, not to make them both upset. And how can a person do that? To do the best he can. So usually the question comes of the mother asks the son to do something and the father is asking the opposite. What should he do? He should please both of them. As long as it's, if it's not a sin, of course if it's a sin, it's obvious not to do the sin. But if both things are uh, permissible, and it's either or, then he should fulfill uh, what the mother asked him for and never to make the father upset. How can he figure that out? Then he should do whatever he can. But the point is not to make the father upset, but to fulfill definitely this is when it's either or like this. Why? Because she has more rights. As long again that the matter is permissible, it's not something that would undermine any rights in one's life, things of that nature. So, Akhoki Ummahat. And the rakuk, uh, it means what's the opposite of being righteous, the opposite to be mean to them, not to fulfill their rights, not to obey them, and so on, has its punishment in this life and in the hereafter. And uh, that's why many things that a person finds in his, in his, in his life, the things that are not going the way he would like for it to happen, maybe if he searched more deeper, he would find it's because of the parents. Not listen to them. Uh, came here without their being pleased. You know, many times this is an issue. And if a person's mother is alive, and we don't have to be politically correct whatsoever, uh, we should just be sure that we do the advice and the nasihah the right way. When a person leaves his mother or father and be far away from them, and the mother is not happy with that, he should definitely be under her feet to serve her, to take care of her. This is more valuable than anything in this world. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that the person should not travel and seek provisions and so on, but the matter is a serious one. Right? Abu Hurairah, how he was righteous to his mother, he would not be able to go for Hajj because he's serving his mother. Waiz al Qarni, he is not from the Sahaba, and the reason why he's not from the Sahaba, that he would not attain this high level to be among the companions of the Prophet, it was said because he was his mother in Yemen, he could not leave her to go to the Prophet ﷺ. And because of that level, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said to the Sahaba, as the man, his name is Uwais, right? When you see him, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make dua for you because his dua is accepted. So Umar anhu, whenever the uh, people coming from Yemen traveling, he would ask them. And he had a sign with leprosy and he was cured. He would ask him about this man. Till one time, he was among them. And he uh, told them, radiallahu anhu, and Uwais uh, al-Qarni told them, do not let anybody know anything about me. But he asked them to make dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him. So you see that there's nothing more uh, love to the Muslim than to go to see the Prophet alayhi salatu But these people, they know the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in matters of what they like in matters of the religion. So you can see that how can the, the parents have been ignored and, and so on. And we think they're happy call them, they're very happy and everything and they wish all kinds of good things for us but a person has to have a moment of truth with himself 
uh, what would they feel then if he's then with them as long as the religion is safe. As long as he would protect his religion, not to do that and then he ruin his religion. You know that if he goes he would become a bad Muslim and so on. Things have to be said in perspective of things and that's why I ask the people of knowledge specifically for each case is a very important one. But this is in general definitely what is best. So Ubrumhat Wa'ad al Banat. Wa'ad al Banat is to bury the, the, the girls alive, to kill them as used to be the practice in Jahiliya, uh, out of the fear of shame or uh, whatever uh, evil intentions they had. Uh, so this is definitely uh, killing uh, a soul that is forbidden. And it's still practiced till today, so we should not think of the Jahiliya as these evil people. If people, evil people are still alive today, and the Jahiliya is still there. When they do these abortions and so on, it's very obvious. And this is, what's the difference between the child being out Right, and crying and still alive in the womb of the mother and to kill him or to kill her. It's the same thing. Out of what? Out of the matters of risk and so on. This is the same evil is there. Right? So it's a, it's a forbidden sin. وَمَنْعِ وَهَدْ وَمَنْعِ وَهَدْ You forbid man'a. Man'a is what? To withhold. And had give. Uh, so what does that mean? To withhold what you're supposed to give. That's forbidden. Like zakat, for example. When a person has to pay zakat, he withholds it. That's not, for, that's not permissible. When a person has the knowledge and he withholds it, that's not permissible. When he has the means to help others and he withholds it, this is not a good thing. Wahad, when a person would ask for things that he has no right to ask. But asking from others without the right to ask, this is also forbidden. Whether it's money or whatever there is, right? as long as the person does not deserve it, this is not a good thing for a person to do. So as you see, this is as a letter very precious that he uh, sent to Muawiyah uh, and each sentence of it is a, a life changing, of course, of how can a person then seek the pleasure of Allah if, if a person doesn't have these types of things. Uh, then uh, he said, حدثنا سليمان بن حرب قال حدثنا حماد بن زيد عن ثابت عن أنس قال كنا عند عمر أنا صد العام السيد ورأت عمر رضي الله عنه he was the خليفة فقال نهينا عن التكلف he said we have been forbidden from التكلف التكلف and I think it's in Urdu also they say تكلف right we were forbidden from التكلف التكلف means is when you uh, comes from a مشاق comes from being in hardship uh, hardship that a person would go out of his way to do things, not the matters of ease. He would make it difficult for himself to do something. Right? The religion is it is easy. Right? What well, there is a, a part of takaluf that is good. What is the good takaluf? Is when a person has something bad in him. So he would make takaluf. He would go out of his way to change this bad habit again. Till it becomes norm in him what is good. He's greedy, right? So he should make the kalif. He should go out of his way to be generous. Give what he doesn't like to give, right? And he keep on doing this. Till after some time the norm becomes that he is a giving person. A person is, does not wake up for fajr prayer, right? Do the kalif, definitely. Set alarms, ask people to wake you up, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sins. You know, take in all the means. Till it becomes the norm, then this is a good thing. So the takalluf in these types of things definitely is a good thing. But not in the, uh, the things that uh, is supposed to be matters of ease. Right? Like for example, if you make wudu, we are ordered to make wudu in a certain way. Don't make takalluf. Don't make it difficult for yourself. Is uh, this uh, one here is wet or not? Uh, did I, you know, the usways comes in place and the whispers of shaitan. When someone asked one of the imma, it was said it was Imam Abi Hanifa rahimahullah when a man asked him when I make wudu and you know the beard, the, the sunnah, if it's a light beard then you can see the skin, you have to wash it of course. If it's a heavy beard, when you wash the face, what is mandatory is the, the what is shown and then from the sunnah is to make the takhdeel, is to put your fingers inside to get things inside. But then he said, he asked him, I'm not sure if when I wash my face in wudu, my beard is wet. Uh, what do I do? So he answered and he said, in Ka'an which 
which means soak it from the beginning of the night. What is the, you know, because the question is like these types of questions. What do you mean? You know, just make wudu, make it easier for yourself. Make wudu and that's it. If you're not sure, soak it from the beginning of the night to make yourself comfortable. Of course, he doesn't mean that. He's answering him in a way that this is not appropriate for you to say that. Take it easy on yourself. Some people, they make the religion difficult for themselves. And shaitan doesn't leave the person alone. Uh, but at the same time, people think that those who follow the way the Prophet said them very strictly, that they are making takaluf. No. Following the truth, definitely they have to do it in the most perfect way. But to go against the way the Prophet said them, this is what the takaluf also, the takaluf comes in the context of showing off. When a person has a guest, then you make takaluf, right? You do all kinds of things, extravagance and so on. It's a good thing for the guest to take care of him more than what you would eat yourself. This is not, this is from the sunnah. So, for example, you normally would eat one dish for dinner, right? One kind only. Mashallah, this is good for you. If you have a guest, don't say, you know, it's extravagance and food is not a good thing. No, fix for him five kinds. It's not, it's not a problem to take care of the guest. But this is not your norm. So I sometimes people, when they invite it somewhere, they think that this is the role of the people, they eat like that every day, no. So to take care of the guest, as long as it's not uh, be wasted or things of that nature, this is not a good thing. So this is not really takaluf, it's part of the deen. But the takaluf is when people go out of their way and to show off and things of that nature. Uh, so the, the matter of the deen is easy, the person should make things his norm and not to show off and make it different to what's uh, then he says, حدثنا أبو اليمان قال أخبرنا شعيب عن الزهري حاء جنكشن in the seventh in the chain وحدثني محمود قال حدثنا عبد النزار قال أخبرنا معمر عن الزهري أخبرني أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه يسأل أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خرج حين زاغت الشمس فصلى الظهر Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came out when the sun حين زاغت after the زوال right and he prayed dawn when the sun went into the other side of the hemisphere that means it's time for dawn Prophet ﷺ prayed dawn فلما سلم when he made salam قام على المنبر he stood up on the منبر on the pulpit فذكر الساعة he mentioned the hour the day of judgment وذكر أن بين يديها أمورا عظاما and he mentioned عليه الصلاة والسلام that Closer to the hour, closer to the day of judgment, there are major matters to happen, meaning the signs of the day of judgment. Thumma qal, then he said, alayhi salatu wassalam, it's the same hadith that we mentioned before, but with some details. Man ahabba an yas'al an shayi, fam yas'al an, whoever loves to ask about anything, ask. Fa wallahi la tas'aluni an shayi, illa akhbartukum bihi ma dumtu fi maqamiha. He said, wallahi, anything you ask me about, I will tell you the answer as long as I'm standing here now. As if now the way where the Prophet will answer any question that they ask. The people start weeping too much when they heard that from the Prophet. And the Prophet kept saying, Ask me, ask me. And the Prophet فقال أين مدخل يا رسول الله؟ A man stood up and he said, Where is my admission? What am I going to be admitted to, O Messenger of Allah? Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said, النار. The hellfire. فقام عبد الله بن حذافة. عبد الله بن حذافة he said, he stood up and he said, من أبي يا رسول الله who is my father, O Messenger of Allah? He said, أبوك حذافة. Your father is حذافة. قال ثم أكثر أن يقول سلم the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم كان سين سلوني سلوني أسمي أسمي فبرك عمر على مكبته عمر رضي الله عنه fell on his knees as a sign of when a person is in dire need right or there is something major is happening فقال رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا we're pleased with Allah as our Lord and with Islam as our Deen and with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasoolah we're not disputing anything, we are pleased this is because he felt like the matter is doing something to upset the Prophet alayhi wa sallam so he said, فسكت رسول الله صلى الله عليه wa sallam حين قال عمر ذلك the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was quiet when Umar radiallahu alayhi wa sallam said that 
ثم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لأن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم سد أولى والذي نفسي بيده that means by the one that my hands or my soul is in his hand meaning Allah سبحانه وتعالى لقد علقت علي الجنة والنار وأنفا the جنة and the fire has been presented to me earlier في عرض هذا الحدث in the width of this wall وأنا أصلي while I'm making صلاة فلم أرى كاليوم في الخير والشر. I did not see nothing like this day from the good and the evil. Of course, the Jannah and the Hellfire, the extreme goodness that nobody can ever imagine, and the Hellfire, the extreme evil that nobody can ever imagine. So the two many uh, asking or questioning the Prophet والسلام, he mentioned it with a different duration. يقول حدثنا محمد بن عبد الرحيم قال اخبرنا روح عن ابن عباده قال حدثنا شعبه قال اخبرني موسى بن انس قال سمعت انس بن مالك قال قال رجل يا نبي الله من ابي قال ابوك فلان ونزلت يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تسالوا عن اشياء. That a man asked the prophet of Allah who is my father he said your father is fulan so and so then the ayah was repeated يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تسالوا عن اشياء تبدا لكم تسؤكم و you believe do not ask about things that if it becomes apparent or clear to you that it would harm you. Mm. Right? It's better for him, was better for him not to ask. Because sometimes when you ask for something like this, it makes you upset. And there are examples like this a person can, we can think of. Like, uh, you know, something happened in the past, for example. A person would get to know some knowledge of something, not knowledge of the team, of course, but something, right, that would make him upset. He was happy before knowing whatever he got to know. Right? And there are many things like this. So a person should not get into too much details of things that would make himself upset. Then, قال حدثنا الحسن المصباح قال حدثنا الشباب قال حدثنا ورقاء عن عبد الله بن عبد الرحمن قال سمعت أنا سبنا ذلك يقول قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الصلاة صلى الله عليه وسلم سأل لن يطرح الناس ويتساءل حتى يقولوا هذا الله خالق كل شيء فمن خالق الله. Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said people will keep on asking, keep on asking, asking, till they say, here is Allah سبحانه وتعالى the creator of all things. Then who created Allah? This is the end of someone asking questions that has no meaning to it, that becomes makes the person contradicting to himself. And this is what atheists and so on they say that the shaitan will keep on whispering to the person this way. With the level of aql and intelligence that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us, right? It's against the basics of it that you would say one thing and the opposite of it, contradicting oneself, right? Everything that we see is makhluk. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created it, right? And for that means it's been created by the Khalik, by the Creator. And for the Creator to be created, that means you're saying what is al mawjud wal adam wahid. Right? We're not getting into philosophy here, but what is present and what is not present becomes the same thing. And it, a person is insane if he says this. Right? And this is against the basics of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And this is what the ayah in the Quran, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Are they created from nothing or are they the creators? Nothing does not create. Nothing does not create, right? Because it's nothing, right? Then are they the creators? Nobody would say that he's the creator, right? That means the matter is very obvious. And the shubha and the doubtful matter will be clear. Actually, it's not a doubtful matter. It's, a, it's evidence that people, when they talk about these matters, because this is only intent. So uh, again, this is the outcome of keep on letting oneself to be in this chain of questioning, questioning, questioning. A person should submit himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last hadith. He says, Haddathana Muhammad ibn Ubaidah. Before we mention the last hadith, the Prophet, uh, the companions of the Prophet sallam, when they came to the Prophet sallam, because it's something important for us to know, uh, and they said to the Prophet sallam, that sometimes whispers of shaitan comes to them that they would not dare to say it. Like these some things of that nature, like what we heard in the hadith. And they hate it so much, right? Which is definitely happens to the believers. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I went to them, did you find this? Does that happen to you? They said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, 
This is the clear iman. This is a sign of an iman. Why? Because you hate it so much. So whenever these whispers come into one's heart and a person feels so much uncomfortable and he hates it so much, this is a sign of an iman. Because human beings are so proud of what they believe. Right? So it's a good sign that a person would hate such a things in himself. Uh, he says, قال حدثنا محمد بن عبيد بن عبيد بن ميمون قال حدثنا عيسى بن يونس عن الأعمش عن إبراهيم عن عقبة عن ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه said كنت مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في حرف بالمدينة I was with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in some cultivated land in the Medina. وهو يتوكل على عسيب when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was leaning on an عسيب or the the palm tree leaves that becomes very strong like a stick. The hadith was mentioned. So the Prophet passed by a group of Jews sitting. Some of them they said, Ask him about a ruh. A ruh is the soul. Ask him. Others they said, Do not ask him. Otherwise he would make you hear what you would hate. Do not ask him. فقاموا إليه أن يستدعى أن يسأل فقالوا يا أبا القاسم أبا القاسم نقول يا أبو الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم حدثنا عن الروح فوما استلس بطء الروح ودسول فقام ساعة ينظر الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم استدعى for an hour looking يقول فعرفت أنه يوحى إليه then I knew that it was revealing to him the revelation comes down to him فتأخرت عنه حتى صعد الوحي في المقام يسأل I stepped away from the Prophet because of the heaviness of the wahy when it comes to the Prophet Then he said, Prophet he said, They ask you, O Messenger of Allah, about the ruh. The ruh is the soul and so on. He said, the ruh is from the matter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you did not give him from the only small amount of knowledge you have been given. And that was it. And there's no benefit of knowing. And there's no need for people to go into deep detail in this. And there's a reason behind it. And this is also from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this is a, this is a clear example that something, something inside of us right, cannot deny it and we don't know even how it looks or what it is. Then how can a person ask the, the, the details, questions about the ghaib and the unseen and so on? If something within our own body that nobody can get to really to know the essence of it. It's something that no one can even know the essence of it. And this is part of us. Right? This is why it says it's an amazing thing. That how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's the unknown that the human beings should humble themselves. If this is the case with something within themselves, that they should humble themselves with whatever knowledge they have no knowledge of, they should humble themselves and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be satisfied and pleased with what have been given to them in the way from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to ask about these things in the way the tradition did not come down. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the proper understanding and to uh, make us among those who are humble. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.